in the 1997 blockbuster movie Titanic. You may remember the famous scene of Leonardo DiCaprio standing on the prow of the great ship, arms outstretched, saying, I'm king of the world! The next year, when James Cameron accepted the Oscar for directing Titanic, at the end of his speech, he shouted, I'm king of the world! This this aspiration for kingship, or queenship for you ladies, it's deeply rooted in our materialistic, superficial culture. Because we think if we could just be kings or queens, we'd be in control of life, and we would have the ability to mold and to shape life to our own liking. If we just could be kings of the world and queens of the world, we could be in control of everything. Well, the, the book of Ecclesiastes, which is our study on Sunday mornings right now, was written by a king, perhaps Solomon himself. But whoever it was, here was a man who had the time and he had the wealth and he had the intelligence to pursue anything he desired. And the book is the journal of his pursuit to find meaning and purpose in life. And we've been given the privilege of reading and studying this journal and, and, and following his journey toward significance. And, and I, I just hope we can learn from it. I hope we can listen and hear and learn from his experiences and his insights. Now, last week, we studied the beginning of the book and the declaration that he makes that everything in life is fleeting, things in life are just like a breath, and, and nothing really has the power to change anything about the reality of the universe. Well, in today's text, Kohelet, which is what we've been calling him, that's kind of the Hebrew translation maybe, Kohelet is going to give us some very specific and contemporary examples of the truth of that opening statement that everything is meaningless. Everything is fleeting. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 12, if you want to open your Bibles to that place. This is going to be a long reading, but it's a fun reading. So stay with me, because we really need to look at all of this at one time as he examines these various things that, that promise to somehow give meaning to life. So Keaton, stay with me. <laughs> he was saying a while ago, this takes up the whole, uh, whole computer. <laughs> But it's a great reading. I, the teacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, look. I've increased in wisdom more than anyone who's ruled over Jerusalem before me. I've experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow, and the more knowledge, the more grief. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs of water to, to water groves of flourishing trees. I, I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. 
I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all of my toil. And yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. And then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? And I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise have eyes in their heads while the fool walks in darkness. But I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. And then I said to myself, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, this too is meaningless, for the wise, like the fool, will not long be remembered. The days have already come when both have been forgotten. Like the fool, the wise too must die. So I hated life, because the work that's done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me and who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil in, into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and, they, and they, then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious strivings with which they labor under the sun? All their days they, their work is grief and pain. Even at night their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This, too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? And to the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand over to the one who pleases God. This, too, is meaningless and a chasing after the wind. Do you recall the leading question of the book back in chapter 1, verse 3, where the writer says, What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Now, Kohelet is going to tell us that he has studied, he has explored every possible way to answer that question. He applied his fabled wisdom to the task. And if the writer is Solomon, then... It's not surprising that he should begin with wisdom because God had gifted him with great wisdom. People came from all over the world to hear Solomon make his wise pronouncements. Wisdom was the foundation of his life. It was the foundation of his rule as king. And so he applied this wisdom to all that is done under heaven, and he found out that this is a really heavy burden that God has laid on mankind. The New English Bible calls it a sorry business. And I take that to mean the task of finding out life's meaning. That's the heavy burden. It's, it's kind of like, as he has a little proverb there, it's kind of like trying to straighten out a corkscrew or to count things that aren't there. Trying to discover what life's all about is, is that difficult. But he says, I'm going to apply myself. First of all, I want to understand wisdom itself. Now, let me tell you, I think what he means by wisdom here is simply the best that humans can do on their own. I think he's talking about human wisdom. And do you know what? Human wisdom is splendid. It's, it's, it's remarkable as far as it goes. Later in the text, he says, wisdom's better than folly. And yet, it has no real permanence. It's like a breath. It's fleeting. Uh, it, it can't really answer our questions about life. The little proverb in verse 18 is very significant. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow, and the more knowledge, the more grief. See, if, if human wisdom and knowledge and learning had the answers, we would be in great shape right now in this world. 
But for all the advancements in human wisdom and knowledge and learning and all of that, folks, there is just as much fear and anxiety and worry and uncertainty and sorrow and grief and violence as there has ever been in the history of the world. All of our learning hasn't changed that. It's meaningless. It is like a breath. It has no real impact on what life is really all about. So wisdom is not the answer. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I turn to pleasure. This means that, that he tried things that brought gladness of heart and joy and fun into his life. And folks, there's nothing wrong with being glad and happy and laughing and having fun. Nothing wrong with that at all. But if you think that's what life is all about, if you think life is only the quest to have fun and have a good time, you're sadly mistaken. You will not find the meaning of life there. And, and it's here that Kohelet, he, he steps right in to our contemporary world. Because there are many, many people today who see life only in terms of how much fun they can have. How much enjoyment they can have in life. So everything they do is geared to bring pleasure and fun into their lives. So they buy stuff and they go places and they inject stuff into their veins and they snort stuff up their noses and they imbibe in drinking and eating and sex all in an effort to have fun. And it turns out to be totally unfulfilling. Again, nothing wrong with having pleasure. Nothing wrong with having fun and laughter. There's nothing really wrong with that unless you think that's what life is all about. I, I heard a story this last week that I think illustrates that truth. I think all of us here, or most of us, have heard the name Deion Sanders. One of the most talented athletes that I've ever heard of. And here in Texas, we all remember uh, him playing cornerback and returning punts and kickoffs for the Dallas Cowboys. Do you know that he also played professional baseball? I bet a lot of people don't know that. He's the only person to hit a major league home run and, store, and score an NFL touchdown in the same week. The only person that ever did that. He's the only person who played in both the Super Bowl and the World Series. But he did that. Deion Sanders, incredibly talented athlete. And in his autobiography, he tells this story. He had just helped the Cowboys win Super Bowl 30, 1996. And he said right after that, he immediately went out and he bought a brand new Lamborghini car. I don't know what they cost in 1996, 18 years ago. But you can't get into one now for less than a quarter of a million dollars. And they go from like a quarter of a million to half a million dollars. Can you imagine having enough money to go out and just buy a car like that. So he went out and he bought a new Lamborghini. And that night, he says, as he lay in bed, he kept asking himself, is this all there is? Is this what it's all about? In spite of all his success and fame and wealth and talent, there was an emptiness in him. Because having pleasure, just having fun, doesn't really answer those deeper questions. And you know, you can buy a new Lamborghini, and in a little while, you're probably going to be bored with it. You're going to want something else. And that's what I think he was finding. Well, Kohelet continues with this, this thinking. He tried great building projects to bring pleasure and enjoyment into his life. The picture in chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, is it's, it's astounding. He surrounded himself with his own forest and gardens and vineyards. It's like he created his own Garden of Eden. And all around him was the fragrance of flowers and the sound of running water, and slaves waited on him hand and foot. Music filled the air. Money was no object. Silver and gold, he, he had that to spare. What, what more could a person want than something like that? Your own golf course. <laughs> Or, that's kind of what he was doing. He should have been insanely happy, but he saw that all of that, that's just meaningless. It's a chasing after the wind. And, and in regard to pleasure, I have to mention one other thing that he talks about because it's become such a large part of our culture. Kohelet says that I had a harem. 
the delights of a man's heart. I like the way the message put it. He says, I gathered a chorus of singers to entertain me with songs and most exquisite of all pleasures, voluptuous maidens for my bed. Hugh Hefner never had it so good. And we're going down that same path as a culture, as a society. I mean, we're trying it all. Heterosexuality, homosexuality, bisexuality, prostitution, same-sex marriages, pornography. If, if real meaning and happiness is to be found in sex, we ought to be the happiest culture in the whole world. And you know that we're not. We should be fulfilled, but we're not, because the meaning of life is not to be found in having fun. It's just not to be found there. Now, in chapter 2, verses 12 through 16, the teacher turns again to the matter of wisdom. And like I said, he realizes that wisdom is better than folly, just like light's better than darkness, and it's better to be able to see than to be blind. So, so getting wisdom and learning and receiving an education, those are good, helpful things. He's not knocking that, and I'm not knocking that. But then, for the first time in the book, not for the last, but for the first time in the book, the fact of death brings his search to a sudden halt. And Kohelet says in verse 16, chapter 2, like the fool, the wise too must die. Being wise, remember, the best that humans can do, being wise, having great learning, earning a Ph.D., does not guarantee that you'll live longer, that you'll be happier, or that you will have more of this world's goods. Death's the great leveler. Great leveler for wise men and fools, good men and bad saint and sinner. It's the great leveler. Listen again to what he says in verse 16. For the wise like the fool will not long be remembered. The days have already come when both have been forgotten. And so as he looks at all of that, he says... I hated life. Hated life. A lot of people feel that way. There are a lot of people in this world, a lot of folks who have almost everything they want, who hate life. Think about it. You look back at the plans, the work, the projects, the hobbies, the training, the education, the investments of time and energy and money, and you see that very little, if anything, was accomplished. It's soon going to all be forgotten, and you have to ask, what does it mean? What's the point of all of it? There's a great line from the TV show The Simpsons. I don't know who said this, whether it was Bart or Homer or somebody else, but here's the quote. The road to the Super Bowl is long and pointless. I mean, when you really think about it, end of quote. And that really got me to thinking. Super Bowl? You know, I'm a great sports fan in some ways. But Super Bowl, World Series, the World Cup, the Masters, the Tour de France, the Final Four, Wimbledon, Indy 500, mean absolutely nothing. I mean, who, we're going to have the final four. I mean, we're going to have the, the, the World Cup final today, Argentina and Germany. And, you know, I don't know or care who's going to win, but it won't make any difference in my life tomorrow. Sorry, Chris. It just won't make any difference in what's going on in this world if Germany or Argentina wins. I... I I think I watched the final four. I can't tell you who won. Now, some of you can, and you could remind me, but I, I can't tell you who won the final four just a couple of months ago because it doesn't make any difference. And it's, it's amazing how we latch on to those things and think that they have significance, and, and they don't. I'm just picking on sports, though you could pick on a whole lot of other things. But that's, that's he's, he's saying something like that. Now, I love watching those things. Nothing wrong with that. They, they give us pleasure. It's fun to go to a ball game. It's fun. But don't think that's what makes life real and that that has any impact, really, on the reality of the universe. The teacher then turns to another possible answer to the questions of life, and that is the building of an enterprise, a business, an empire, or a fortune. Can't you picture it? 
Some of you have done this. You work, you think, you plan, you compete, you sacrifice, you worry, you skip vacations, you add hours, you increase, increase responsibility, you invest, you save, you risk, you work, and finally you've done what you set out to do, but, but wait, you're going to die. And you're going to leave it to somebody, and you don't know if that person's going to be a fool or a wise person. And how often have we seen this happen? Somebody builds an empire. And they leave it to a son or a daughter who goes through it in a couple of months' time. And it's all gone. I have seen it with my own eyes, especially in the ranching business. A guy, all of his life, he worked to build a ranch and a cattle operation and leaves it to a son. And it was gone within just weeks, <laughs> just wasted. And he's saying that that's, that's meaningless. If that's what you're counting on, if you think that's what gives life its meaning, building some kind of enterprise. And even worse, for some people, is what he says in verse 19. Yet they, that's talking about the person who's going to inherit or the person who's going to take over your enterprise. They will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured all my effort and skill. Just think, you won't have control. And Boy, that's a big word for a lot of people. But you won't have control over what you have worked to achieve. And that loss of control, it may not wait until you die. Jules Abels tells this story in his book, The Rockefeller, Rockefeller Billions. And I quote, John D. Rockefeller had an income of approximately a million dollars a week toward the end of his life. Let me interrupt there. Can you imagine that? Making a million dollars a week, $52 million a year. Can you imagine that? Anyway, that's what he had coming in. Now on with the quote. Yet his doctors allowed him only to eat a bare minimum at breakfast, a drop of coffee, a spoonful of cereal, a forkful of egg, a bit of chop the size of a pea. Rockefeller was the richest man in the world, but he didn't have the ability to enjoy even his food. He lost control. Even for, you know, with all that he had, the great empire he had built, he, he couldn't even enjoy a meal at the end of his life. Now, when you hear all of that that I've said, that'll make a cynic out of you. That'll make you very cynical. Derek Kidner wrote in his book on Ecclesiastes, and I like this. He said, if every card, listen, if every card in our hand will be trumped, does it matter how we play? Does it matter if every domino is going to be trumped, what difference does it make what you throw out there? You can become very cynical, but we don't have to. I don't think, I don't think Kohelet wants us to become cynical because our text ends on a much more positive, cheerful note. Folks, maybe we just are trying too hard. I, I think that may be a problem. We're just trying too hard uh, in, in almost everything. I, I see a lot of people who are just trying too hard to be, quote, spiritual, whatever that means. They're just, they're just trying so hard that they have no happiness in their lives. And we do that with everything else. Maybe we're putting too much faith in the fleeting, transitory things of this world. And so in verse 24, the teacher counsels us, a person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. Rightly understood and used, the basic things of life are sweet and they're good and they are a gift from God, food and drink, being able to enjoy those things and, and, and taking pleasure in, in your work and in a job well done. Those are good things. What spoils them is our human efforts to get more out of them than they can possibly give. Now, Koalet's going to have a whole lot more to say, a lot more advice to give, I think, about this. But, but right now, Right now, can, can I just leave you with that message? Enjoy the simple things of life. Eat and drink and, and take joy in the task that, that is before you every day. And I hope that this message will help all of us to look at life more realistically. 
Because if you're thinking that wisdom and learning and education, or if you're thinking that pleasure, or if you're thinking that building an enterprise is really going to, that's what it's all about, that's not realistic. Those things will not add to the meaning of life. But I hope that we can look realistically. And maybe, maybe as we go through this series of lessons, we'll change a little bit in the way that we live every day before God. It can do nothing better than to just enjoy the simple things, eating and drinking, and your daily work. What a beautiful thing that is. And I pray that that's what we'll be able to do. I know I haven't said much about Jesus today, but he's behind all of it, and he's the one who really gives meaning. Only Jesus can give us meaning in life. And we're going to sing a song now because he lives. That's what really gives us purpose. That's what really gives us hope.